Uh, our key text this morning is from Nehemiah, the fifth chapter, verse 14. If you have your, or four, I should say Nehemiah 4, verse uh, 14. You can hold that in readiness. Nehemiah 4, 14. I've entitled our message today, Do Not Be Afraid, Remember and Fight. Don't be afraid, remember and fight. These words were spoken by Nehemiah. Now, a little background information. Again, it's been uh, many, many, many years uh, between the fall of Jerusalem by the Babylonians and the time that Nehemiah receives word that his homeland is in ruins. Ezra actually pens the book of Nehemiah. He's the scribe. And, uh, and when Nehemiah hears it, of course, he, he, he is uh, he's, uh, upset. He cries. He weeps. He fasts. All that information is in the first chapter. And then he asked God to open up a door and a window for him. God, open up a window for me, an opportunity to go back to my homeland and rebuild the walls that are in ruins. And eventually God allowed him to do that. Now, they're getting the walls built, but there's this constant struggle. There's this constant fever running throughout the camp of negativity. And it's brought on primarily by a guy named Sam Ballot. Okay, now that name's important even today. In fact, in Nehemiah, the, uh, the second chapter, when Sam Ballot heard uh, that they were rebuilding the walls, Ezra says these words. He was uh, deeply disturbed because uh, they, Nehemiah, and the crew that was making their way back to Jerusalem, the builders, the architects, the soldiers, all the folks that were going back, he was disturbed because they had the well-being of the children of Israel in mind. He hated the Jews. He didn't want to see the Jews succeed in anything. He hated the fact that something good was going to happen to the nation of Israel. The name Sambal itself actually means hatred in secret. So this guy, he's got a terrible name, he's got a terrible lifestyle, and he's full of hate. Know anybody like that? Know anybody like that? Dangerous, dangerous people. Here's the point. He is going to do everything he can to distract the nation of Israel the builders, and all the energy going back to the homeland to rebuild the wall. And so Nehemiah catches this negativity. He senses the people are getting discouraged. He sees the people losing their unity and mind to work. So he brings the nobles together, brings the whole crowd together. And this is what he says. And I looked, and I arose, and I said to the nobles, and to the leaders, and to the rest of the people, and I read this with me, ready? Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. That is one of the most fundamentally challenging verses in the book of Nehemiah. Many years, again, have transpired between the fall and the rebuilding. And within this one verse, we see three commands. Three commands given to the builders, the warriors, and the families who made the trip all the way back to Jerusalem from Persia to undertake this enormous task. Number one, Nehemiah says, you got to stop letting fear drive you. And you got to stop being afraid of this guy, Sam Ballot. I know he's got a lot of momentum. And I know he's got a lot of influence. In fact, he's influenced other people. And Nehemiah says, every time I get up and I read the paper, he's on the front page discouraging us from the task ahead. And I thought to myself, how many Christians today How many believers today, how many statesmen today have started off with a full head of steam, courageously defending biblical truth, honor, and justice, and have been derailed because of the they? Let me challenge all of us today. You don't have to think hard. You don't have to think long. But there is a Sam Ballad in your life. And if there isn't one now, there will be one soon. You've got to determine as well as I do. Whether I will let the they's distract me from the mission that God has put into our lives. Elsa Maxwell was a longtime member of the CBS broadcasting team. He tells of the time that his dad beckoned him to his bedside just before he passed away. He looked at his son and he said, you've got to go out of the world and you've got to make your own living. You've got to make it for yourself. You can't depend on others to do for you. This age and day we live in of entitlement driven mentality our country was built on the fact that people assume responsibility for their behavior and their future we ought to get back to those days before you leave this room he says i want to leave you a legacy before i pass away son i want to leave you a legacy three simple rules but the first rule was the most important he says never be afraid of the they 
His dad said, strong generals with great armies will face courageously the most outrageous foes. Yet be terrified of what the they might say, what the they might do, and what they might think. You say, Jim, that's me. I started off strong. I had great vision. I had great desires. I I had the Holy Spirit working within me. and, And yet I had a family member or I had a friend. Or I'm in a a relationship that's not healthy, Jim. And that relationship, that ungodly relationship has cornered me and has not allowed me to, to grow in the Holy Spirit and the work and ways of the Lord. Let me challenge you today. Find out who the Sam Ballad is in your life and confront it. Amen? How many grand and glorious movements have stalled out under the enormous pressure inflicted on good elders on preachers and missionaries by this inv- invisible yet very influential influential group of phantom days. Sermons have gone unpreached. Christian schools have gone unstarted. Missions have gone unfunded. Leadership and additions have left incomplete. Money's gone uncollected. Ministries left unattended because leadership was worried, pressured, and hamstrung by the they. So Nehemiah looks at these bewildered men and women who at this point have already completed much of the wall. And then in verse 6 of Nehemiah, the third chapter, he says the entire wall was joined together up to half of its height. You guys have already got half of it complete because you've had a mind to work. You're working together. You're unified. You're not letting these outside sources distract you from the mission God has sent us to do. And he reminded them that we were as close to finishing, but you cannot finish this project if you give up. As I said earlier in this message, we will have critics. We will have people whose sole goal is to try to destroy your faith, to try to distract you from the power of the Holy Spirit, to de-emphasize the value of biblical truth and undermine the integrity of Scripture. It might be someone at work. It might be someone you're dating. It might be someone as close as the person sitting next to you. I certainly hope not, but it may be. But the reality is there's someone in your life or will come into your life if the Holy Spirit's working and doing great things that will take you off path. Don't let them. Don't let them. Listen, my friends. Too many ministries have been squelched. Too much vision has been diminished and eclipsed because of the they. Fear is crippling our nation. It's crippling our movement. We are oftentimes more concerned about placating the crowd and cozying up to present culture than standing firmly on the apostles' doctrine and solid, biblical, transcendent truth. Paul lets Timothy on a very profound promise, and one that is as much for us as it was for him in 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. He says to Timothy, look, the battle is real. The critics against the church are alive and well. There are people that are trying to destroy the gospel, trying to undermine the doctrine of the church. Judaizers, Gentiles that really aren't converted are doing everything they can to undermine this grand movement called the New Testament church. But he says to Timothy, Timothy, God did not give you a spirit of fear, but rather of power, love, and self-discipline. And I want to challenge our congregation today to understand that. If you're operating under fear, if you're operating under this false notion that God is somehow distant from you and that the power of the Holy Spirit is for everybody but you, I want to remind you today, if you have a spirit of of fear, it has not come from the Holy Spirit. You were converted to Christianity, and so was I, so that I could face adversity every day, that I could stand toe-to-toe with Sam Ballot and say, I will not be corrupted by fear. I no longer operate under that, but now self-love, discipline, and the power of God's Spirit within me. Can you imagine what would happen if every church across America today would operate under the principles and promise of 2 Timothy 1, 7? Now, you've heard me allude to 2 Samuel 23, verse 20. A few months ago, we did a series entitled Tipping Point Moments, and we focused on a gentleman named Benaiah. He was at the top of his game. He was David's army guard. He eventually became uh, Solomon's guard of his army. The Bible says in verse 20 of 2 Samuel 23, he went down and killed a lion in the midst of a pit on a snowy day. And I beat that verse in the ground for a whole month, but I challenged every member of this congregation. What lion has God put in your path to chase? You can't chase lions if you're chasing trivial pursuits. Mark Batterson says it this way, God-sized dreams require more risk, more sacrifice, and more faith. When was the last time my faith was stretched? When was the last time I took a risk for God? 
When was the last time I stood up to the critics who denied the principles of New Testament Christianity, who mocked traditional family values and said, I will no longer be directed or moved or motivated by the Sam ballots of contemporary culture. I am gifted by God through the power of His Holy Spirit. Therefore, we will take risks, we will take the sacrifice, and we will develop a mature faith to lead this congregation in the future. You know, I, uh, I'm excited about a new plan and program we're in- installing in our men's ministry. And it's taken right from Nehemiah, the fourth chapter, or verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 14. And it's called the Fight Club. Now, relax, ladies. It's not a, an octagon where your husband's going to get beat up for 10 weeks. But we are starting. Maybe that's what you think is necessary. and Maybe that comes at a later time. But we are starting a Fight Club based on verse 14 of Nehemiah. And we're going to challenge every man over a 10-week period of time. And this Bible study actually begins the very first Wednesday night of our electives, okay? And for, uh, and for 10 weeks, over a 10-week period of time, guys who sign up for this class, this highly intensive program will be challenged to revolutionize the way they think as men. Over 10 weeks, they're going to grow intellectually, spiritually, physically, and relationally. Men will see absolute change within their life. They will recognize through weekly challenges ways in which they can grow and develop and mature in a way they thought never could happen. Why? Because we want our men in this church to know that there are those who will come behind them. We want them to fight for their families. And so, guys, if you're looking for a challenge, you can sign up today on the electives table. And uh, you're going to be challenged in ways over a 10-week period of time, and you're going to graduate from that program, and you're going to realize God has a plan for you. But God-sized plans and God-sized dreams require risk, sacrifice, and a lot more faith than we may be exercising right now. Point number two, Nehemiah says, remember the Lord great and awesome. Remember the Lord great and awesome. The word remember reminds me a lot. It says to me, Jim, if you don't have things in your life to cause you to remember, you're going to forget. Now, in a few minutes, we're going to take of this Lord's Supper. Isn't it interesting that Jesus instituted this supper for a reason? He says, I want you to do this in remembrance of me. I don't want you to forget the sacrifice. I don't want you to forget the gift. I don't want you to forget the cross. I don't want you to forget the blood that was shed on the cross, which gives us hope and salvation and eternal life. And humans tend to forget stuff. That's why we write everything down, because we can't remember. You know, the other day, I and I don't have, I tell you what, I'm working on it. Oh, I'm working on it. Um, Ross Pepper had a gift to remember names. You all know that, right? If you were in this church and Ross was here, Ross could meet you one time. Fifty years later, you could walk up to me to remember your name, your kid's name, your grandkid's name, everything about you. I'm not joking. That gift was not handed off to me, I will tell you that right now. Man, I have absolutely no memory at all. Uh, I felt so terrible. I felt so terrible. I had a guy walk to me three weeks ago. He says, Jim, do you remember my name? Do you remember my name? And I said, I don't remember the name, but the breath is familiar. And he got very offended. And then I realized that was not the thing to say. So I'm learning how to couch things differently. But anyway, we need to remember. We need to remember. It's important. Jesus said, do this in what? Do this and remember me because I know what happens if you don't. You'll forget. And I don't want you to forget that cross. And I don't want you to forget what happened on that cross. We do that to remember. So Nehemiah brings everybody together. All the nobles and the builders. He said, everybody put your tools down. Bring your moms, your dads, your kids, everybody together. Bring everybody together. Because I'm going to remind you that we serve a God who is great and awesome. Because I think you've forgotten. All you hear is the media of mass deception in your ear, breathing down insults to the church, and insults to biblical truth, and mocking you for absolutely believing in traditional values. And you're hearing that every day, and you start wondering, well, is God real? Is the Scriptures true? Should I comply to the principles of the New Testament? And I'm going to challenge you. The answer is yes, but don't forget how awesome and great God is. And if you do, you'll start questioning His authority and His greatness and His sovereignty and His power. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Now, this is a verse all of us, all of us need to take to heart today. Trust in the Lord with how much of your heart? All of it. Let's don't bargain with God. I can't say to God, well, God, I'll give you the part of my heart that I feel I can do away with. God says, get out of here, Jim. It's all or nothing. I'm not here to bargain with you. Trust in God. Believe in God. Even when you don't understand God. Even it means you have to have a very difficult conversation with someone today about your faith. 
and where you are in this relationship and how serious you are about God. He's like, I don't know if I can do this. Let me tell you something. You can't alone, but with God you can. Trust in the Lord with every ounce of your heart and stop leaning on your own intuitions in all of your ways. Every way, Jim, from the minute you wake up to the minute you go to bed, in every way, acknowledge him. And just let him carve out a path for you. And I'm saying, God, are you really able and capable and willing to do that for me? You're actually willing to carve out my life for me? And you know what God says? Yeah, Jim, if you'll get out of the way. When you're in for the fight of your life, remember the Lord great and awesome. When you're fighting to save your marriage, remember the Lord great and awesome. When you don't know how you're going to raise the money to send your kid to college, or to put your kid into overseas mission work. Remember the Lord great and awesome. As a preacher, sometimes I say, okay, Lord, how are we going to pay these bills? we got a growing school. we got a ministry center we're paying off. we got enormous amounts of money we raise every week to keep this institution, this great church going. And I say, Lord, how's it going to do? How are we going to do it? And the Lord reminds me, Jim, remember you're serving a God who's what? Great and awesome. Stop shortchanging the Lord. There's a reason why God wants us to rely on Him. Because we can't experience the victory, and He doesn't want us to take credit for it. Young David's words to Goliath, the pagan Philistine, has always resonated with me in my ministry. When David stood face to face with Goliath, you've got to remember, he's in his late teens or early 20s. And he looks behind him, and he's got all the people of Israel, the army, and leaders behind him. And there he stands, staring Goliath in the face, this nine and a half foot giant. And he's been breathing insults on the people of Israel and on David. And after he gets done bloviating and challenging the nation of Israel and blaspheming the name of God, David just looks at him and says, Remember the Lord who is both great and awesome. The battle is the Lord's, and he's going to give me into your hands today. Now, we're all facing giants. There's a Sam Ballad in your life that's bringing you down, tearing you down, discouraging you. And there's always a Goliath in your life, a giant that you feel cannot be beaten. It may be coming in the form of an addiction. Maybe your Goliath is pornography or alcohol or self-doubt or or a sense of worthlessness or past mistakes you can't get over. But I'm asking you today to remember the Lord great and awesome and look square in the face of your Goliath And say the words that David said thousands of years ago. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. The battle is the Lord's. And today, He's going to give me into your hands. Too many churches across our brotherhood haven't done anything significant over the last 20 years. That could be considered either great or awesome. Because they've rejected the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. We see churches buying chairs and they think they've done something great and awesome. But they forget it's the God of the universe who's going to fill them. We start schools, but it's a great God who will send the students. We put water in the baptistry, but we forget it's God who's going to send the tired and the desperate souls to be cleansed. Sometimes I think we forget who we're working for and who's working in us. Walter Williams, a syndicated columnist, writes, Western civilization was founded on a set of philosophies that focus strongly on the sanctity of individuals and their power of logic and ability to reason, all which is a gift from God. This belief led to a desire to trust things that could be proven to be true or legitimate. Formed government to science to Judeo-Christian morality has formed the basis of what most Western notions of ethics and behavioral standards come from. Thus, the attack on Western civilization must begin with the attack on the church and Christian values, and we see that every day in postmodern America. We see the family under attack, the family unit and marriage, according to Scripture, constantly being undermined by contemporary society. The reason why the church and Christian values and family targets of the left is they want people's loyalty and allegiance to be to the state. But when we see the greatness of our nation, the greatness of our families, and the greatness of our church, we see it's a reliance not on self, but on the supremacy of God. And I pray that one day, We'll recognize that again. Please note, as we come to the final part of this sermon, Nehemiah says, I 
I want you to rebuild the wall. We need to have it finished. Our security is in this. But if you don't have the energy, if you don't have the desire and the unction to finish it for yourself, would you at least do it for those who come behind you? Do it for those who come behind you. Every man and woman who has a child or children ought to carry pictures with them in their wallets or on their phone. From time to time, it would behoove you to take that phone out and look at the picture of your spouse and your children and remind yourself every day that your reasons for staying faithful to the Lord and involved in His kingdom work is because not only do you want to remain faithful, but you want to remain faithful to those who come after you. I frequently, when I travel, sitting in airports or airplanes, will review photos of our family. Even though my girls are, or one of them is, is traveling right now in a way, I, I will send pictures to her, remind her that she's carrying out the traditions of the faith and remind her to be faithful to the Lord. Why? Because we need our children and our grandchildren to carry the torch long after we're gone. I uh, am so proud of what God is doing through Kissimmee Christian Academy. Four years ago, we started with 12 kids. Friday, we have registered our 104th student here at KCA. We started with two and three-year-olds. Now we go through seventh grade. And I, I, I think to myself, of all the folks that have invested in that school, and here's what's interesting. Because I was thinking about it the other day. I was like, you know, Jim, two of your kids have graduated from high school, and Mandy's my third, and she's timed out of KCA. She's in 10th grade this fall. And then I realized, no, I'm, I'm doing it for those who come behind us. I want to do it for those who come behind us. We've had a number of people in this auditorium who wrote significantly large checks to get that building started. You have no children at Upwards Sports. You have no children at KCA reason why you help build that building and you support it and you finance it is because you want to make sure Kissimmee Christian Church and Academy is here long after you're gone. You're doing it for those who come behind you. Vaughn and Mary Williams are extremely successful business people. I've known Vaughn Williams since uh, he was an elder at First Christian Church Orlando. Uh, just after I had graduated from college, um, they were in between preachers at First Orlando, and I was their interim. Bobby and Patsy Thomas, I got to meet them when they were there, and that's a long time ago. And I remember walking in at the side door with the choir and Vaughn Williams every Sunday for eight weeks until, until they got their real preacher. And, uh, and from time to time, I see Mary and Vaughn um, in the foyer with these T-shirts on. And it's the T-shirts that our children's workers wear. You may not know this, but um, they volunteer in our preschool department every month. They've got grandkids older than some of your kids. But they do this because they want to make sure that the legacy of this church and the New Testament church is safe for those who will come behind them. Ronnie Forehand is retired from the Internal Revenue Service. Um... He handles our books. And he's here hours and hours every week making sure that the academy and the church's books are clean and up to date and make sure we track every penny. Now, Ronnie says that he has a desire to make sure that everything is done properly. I say, no, the reason why you're putting so many hours in the church is trying to offset all the years of the IRS. But he says that's not true. (laughs) I'm just kidding. I love to give him a hard time. Honest, honest, most honest guy you'll ever see. But reason why he does that is because he wants to make sure that it's done right, not just for this present generation, but for those who come behind. Look, we're not going to be here forever. And, and when you look at the church and you see the amount of energy and effort that's put into the younger generation, please note 
that that's because we believe that we're going to hand this torch over one day. And I love this church for so many reasons. I was wa- watching a number of people walk in. We've got not just one, not just two, but three generations of families attending this church. It's because you've handed the torch to those who come behind you. And so when our kids came back from Christ the Youth Conference, over 50 kids and youth sponsors, I was so thrilled because I knew that that's the generation that's prepared to take over when we leave. And I believe you're capable. We simply cannot allow the, or permit through a spirit of indifference to let the church and the message of the cross die on our watch. Paul says in Galatians 6, 9, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for we will reap a harvest. But we can't give up. Morris Butler book in his book Gospel Trailblazers wrote there is sufficient evidence on record in modern times that God's people will prosper when they earnestly cling to the New Testament ideals. The Churches of Christ, an independent Christian church, became known as the fastest growing religious body in America over 150 years ago. One of the ministers of an Ohio congregation of our own brotherhood became the president of the United States, none other than the martyred statesman, the late James A. Garfield. Another one of our preachers years before was invited by President James Madison to stand before the assembled Congress of the United States to preach the gospel of the New Testament. And Alexander Campbell held those lawmakers spellbound for nearly two hours preaching the word of God. Can you imagine hearing a gospel preacher stand in the halls of Congress and preach for two hours on nothing but the transcendent truths of God's word? Listen, I'm praying one day that that could happen again. Infidelity was stalled in its tracks on this continent in the glorious past days of burning conviction within God's people from sea to shining sea. Foreignisms and religious heresies paled and were appalled before the onward prairie fire sweep of the restoration preaching. Men and women and children who loved the Lord were finally hearing the plain, pure, and powerful gospel of the apostolic days. Multitudes of people were discerning the lecturings of formalisms and false doctrine and lighting their lanterns of evangelism for the flaming torch of this newly discovered liberty in Jesus Christ. I'm here to tell you, I am praying, and I believe that this nation can experience that revival again, but it won't unless the church understands that the time is ripe, the time is now. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. Forget about the they and stand firmly on the truth of God's divine word. Listen, if God's people will do that and will lean on the promises of the Holy Spirit, we can once again see that kind of revival. But we cannot depend on that revival to start in the halls of Congress or in the halls of our major universities until that revival first starts in the church of Jesus Christ. And I pray that it starts here. The apostles were so powered up by the Holy Spirit that they turned Asia Minor up for the kingdom of God. Let it not be said that we in the 21st century fail to keep the fire of revival burning in our churches today. Let it not be said that the baptistry waters were unstirred or go unstirred under our watch. Let it not be said that classrooms will be half full on our time. Let it not be said that weary souls and that the hurting cannot find relief in our congregation and within our fellowship. I believe that God is moving. And I believe that Kissimmee Christian Church has experienced revival. But I think greater days are still ahead. And so today, my encouragement as we come to a close is to not be afraid. Not be afraid. Remember the Lord, awesome and great. And remember that you're not just staying faithful for yourself, but you're staying faithful to those who come behind you.